Video games often have unspoken rules, sensibilities that people develop over years of playing lots of different types of games, and some of them just throw all of it out. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 times games broke all the video game rules. Starting off with number 10, it's Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. If there's one ironclad rule when it comes to designing games, it's that if you tell the player something in the tutorial, it has to be true. If every game came out and said jump by pressing A, but you actually jump by pressing Y, then tutorials would be meaningless because nobody would trust them. That would basically be anarchy, right? The developers of Hellblade realize a implicit trust gave them an opportunity to add a layer of tension to the game that otherwise wouldn't be there. At the start of the game, after dying once in a scripted event, the game tells you more or less that if you die too many times from this point forward, the game will delete your save and you'll have to start over from the beginning. For a lot of people, just the warning was enough to get them on edge. I know it spooked me, and it made me play as cautiously as possible. I, I believed this for quite a while, to be frank. And so did a lot of others. A bunch of people even just gave up there. They saw the message and thought, eh, that's too much. I'm not doing that. And, and this simple message totally changed how players experience the game. But here's the thing. It's, it's just not true. In the same way Fargo says it's based on a true story, but the whole thing's actually made up, this message, total fabrication. There's no punishment for dying too much. The game would never delete your save. And it was a lie to make the player paranoid, which is how the main character feels. With players having more access to developers than ever before, we do know that games actually lie to us all the time, like about how much damage we take or how far off a platform we are, and a million other little things, but Hellblade took things a step further. They said there was a major game mechanic that could potentially lose hours of gameplay that didn't exist. And number nine is Far Cry 4. Most games want you to experience their content to the fullest. They want you to do everything possible and get the most out of the game. Developers put years of hard work into games they make. They want a game that people like and spend a lot of time with. That's like, yeah, obvious. Yeah, it's a job. People get paid for it, so they do want money, but most people don't want to just make stuff that people hate either. One thing devs just don't want is for players to turn their game on play it for 15 minutes, and get a satisfying ending. That's what makes Far Cry 4 very different, even from games that do something similar like Far Cry 5 and 6. In those games, it's possible to end the game early, but the ending isn't exactly satisfying. They both imply your work is left unfinished. In Far Cry 4, the first game in the series to pull this trick, it's presented differently. In many ways, the ending, which occurs if you just simply sit and wait in the bad guy Pagan Min's compound for about 15 minutes after he tells you he's got something and he'll be right back, now, please, stay right here. Enjoy the Crab Rangoon. Don't move. I will be right back. Yuma, we need to talk. You get an ending. He does come back, and alongside you, he takes you to where you need to go to spread your mother's ashes, which is the goal of the game. Normally, it takes dozens of hours to do, but if you just wait, it's over in less than an hour. What's wild about it is they just give you the twist ending right there. It's a more or less the same ending you get normally, only with a lot less violence and bloodshed. That's what's so rule-breaking about this sequence. It doesn't just drop a joke ending on you or cut to black with some snarky text. The ending you get for finishing the game early is as much a real ending as the one you get after 30 hours. It goes against most game designers' instincts, too, but really, the ending is triggered before any real gameplay even starts. If you drop 60 bucks to get this game on release day, you're not going to take that ending, take the disc out of the tray, and snap it in half. You're probably going to play it again, right? I don't know. It's weird. But, like, you don't get something particularly different when you do. And number eight, it's Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Been more than half a decade since Breath of the Wild came out, so it's easy to take its innovations for granted, but even this far in the future, many of the things actually do seem kind of sacrilegious towards normal game design principles. Most open world games are highly tutorialized with a long series of missions that get the player accustomed to the gameplay. Breath of the Wild has something kind of like that, but you're free to ignore it, and a lot of players do. Uh, the game lets you climb almost anywhere, the only limits your stamina and when this game came out handholds were common in most open world games especially ones that were focused on climbing like assassin's creed nah, those were pretty minor compared to the fact the game just gives you all the powers right from the start too normally these things take time to acquire and you get them by completing dungeons but you get them in the equivalent of the tutorial and you're free to use them 
anytime you want from there. Most open world games limit your progress or level gate certain areas, but Breath of the Wild basically lets you do whatever. Certain areas are tougher, but there's nothing really locking you out from exploring the entire world after the tutorial zone is done. The game lets players make things as difficult or as easy as they want. The devs let players break the game or get around puzzles, find ways to cheat the system. It's mostly completely allowed too. On the other hand, if you want to rush to the ending, the game allows that as well. The game offers a level of freedom that isn't just unusual for a Legend of Zelda game. It's pretty out there for open world games full stop. Even now, few games have managed to capitalize on the opportunities and ideas this game presented. Like Tears of the Kingdom is kind of it. And it greatly expands it to such a point where it's absurd to think that some other developer will manage what they managed there. And in terms of power, it's on the least powerful main mainstream hardware. God, everything about Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and Tears of the Kingdom really, it's remarkable. The Zelda series was ultimately really formulaic, and now it's probably one of the most innovative and experimental game series out there. And number seven is Inscription. Uh, in the 2010s, we started to see more games that could be best described as trickster games, ones that intentionally deceived the player. Inscription, not the first, but definitely one of the best. What starts off as a pretty standard, but pretty fun roguelike card game becomes something much, much more. At first, it starts off with odd details like cards talking to you. Then you notice that you can actually stand up and walk around the spooky cabin uh, and solve puzzles. It seems like that's the whole game too. Uh, just one small subversion added in a meta narrative to a roguelike but it gets a lot more complicated from there this is act one in uh the two other major acts the game completely changes i'm not just talking about the card game either I'm talking about the visuals the story takes a hard turn into something completely different it's a hell of a ride nothing in the game's steam page or pre-release information hinted that there was anything more to it the developers uh, sort of bucked the trend that most developers want a player to know what they're getting these guys, <laughs> they did not want that. Most of Inscription is hidden up the sleeve. I'm sure there's a lot of people who played this game, maybe for multiple hours, without realizing there's more to it. Things really start getting wild by the end, too. The game pulls some creative tricks, like reading actual files on your computer to taunt you. They even go so far as to threaten to delete files off your PC. That's something they'd never do, right? They wouldn't actually do it. Of course they wouldn't. But if, if, if they did, imagine they did. People would be really pissed off. That's why you don't you don't run games uh that start throwing you curveballs like that in administrator mode don't do that i don't think that this would do it even with administrator mode but still hey big warning right here uh phantom liberty spoilers for this upcoming point so skip this point if you don't want to be spoiled for that because we gonna talk specifics and number six is cyberpunk 2077's phantom liberty expansion you know how video games are supposed to end right you attack the floating castle dethrone the gods save the world not quite over the top uh in that way in cyberpunk's case just barely though the standard ending has you assault arasaka tower and daring raid that cements your status as a night city legend whether you live or die with the phantom liberty expansion uh, there's a completely new ending that can be accessed after finishing the expansion. I assumed it would be like a different contract for the Arasaka Tower assault, but uh, no, it's completely different. Instead of attacking the company in a desperate attempt to cure uh, what the relic in your head is doing to slowly kill you, Solomon Reed offers a much more mundane solution, uh, surgery. This hemisphere's top surgeons are waiting to help you. It'll work, rest assured. It seems like the whole thing's just more bait hanging in front of you that's gonna get pulled away in the last minute. The game is kind of full of attempts to find a cure that end in failure, so what's one more? But no, uh, this actually happens. You get in a helicopter, you say goodbye to Johnny Silverhand, and you wake up in a hospital. What makes this ending so unusual, so rule-breaking, is just how normal it is. Usually this kind of mundane reality is glossed over in games, uh, and in any other RPG, an ending like this would it'd be like a few slides with some narration, but here, it's kind of big. It's, it's over an hour long, and you get to see in precise detail how basically nothing you did or even would have done made a lot of difference, and life goes on. It kind of seems like a cruel joke at first, but it's really not. For a game as over the top as Cyberpunk often is, this ending is really human and relatable. It's hard not to 
talk about it without spoiling everything. In fact, I think we've probably spoiled a lot of it by saying the person is cured. But uh, in the world of video games, it feels really subversive to end your story in a way that takes away the player's agency, but somehow is still satisfying. And wow, did they do that? Moving on to number five, it's Shenmue. While we're on the topic of mundane things that seem out of place in video games, Shenmue! What makes this game seem so odd compared to other open world games is how totally freaking obsessed with the mundane it is. This is an epic revenge story, and it's not about running around and kicking ass. It's actually about getting change to put into vending machines that give you a little toy in a little one of those little bubble things and collecting them. Huh? No, it's it's about slowly investigating leads and getting money together for a trip to follow the killer. It's the sort of stuff that games don't usually bother with, uh, partly because real life is is not the most exciting thing in the world. In this case, I'm not immediately saying all the dull, busy work makes a game better or worse. I'm just saying I'm calling it unique. Nowhere is, is this more true than near the end of the story where Ryu gets a job uh, as a forklift operator. And, and I'm not saying like this is a forklift mini game that you do once and then like maybe it's a side quest that you can do if you're bored and want to make a little extra coin uh no you actually have to go there and operate a forklift daily for about a week as a real job and if you don't figure out how to progress the story from there you have to keep doing it because it's your job for even the most hardcore fans of the series the whole segment gets very old uh, but it is part of the presentation the sequel Shenmue 2 finds a little bit of a better balance between the dull realities of real life and the epic revenge story but I think it's safe to say that Shenmue 1 did something completely different than anything else out there maybe not for the sake of fun but i didn't say that breaking the rules always was exciting and enjoyable i just said it was breaking the rules And number four is Demon Souls. You know how final bosses are supposed to go, right? They're the culmination of everything leading up to that point. The ultimate challenge. There's plenty of games that don't do that and end with disappointingly lame and easy fights or worst of all, the QTE boss battle, which reek of developers running out of time and money and really just uh, thoughts on what a proper fight should be. I don't know. There's plenty of games that have unsatisfying final bosses though, unintentionally. But there are some who do it knowing exactly what they're doing and uh, that's Demon Souls. Demon Souls is relentlessly odd. Many of the bosses are trick encounters that can be easily beaten if you know their weaknesses, and a lot of them can almost barely be described as bosses, even the giant soul bosses you encounter at the end of each archstone area. But even after all that, I was still unprepared for what I would find at the end of this game. The story of Demon Souls is that the kingdom is being tormented by this being called the Old One, an ancient demon that's woken up. In any other game, it's your job to put them back to sleep by beating them up but this game, yeah, it's different than that. So you travel underneath the Nexus and you find yourself in a strange void with this gigantic old one in front of you. You travel inside the creature, ready to face off with the king, the guy who started this whole mess. The fake king you fought earlier was tough as hell, so this is this real one, this real king. Oh, that's that's going to be bad, isn't it? So you enter the boss arena and um, all, there's the king. He's there, uh, but he's kind of more of a blob now. He can barely move and his attacks are really pitiful, but there he is. That's the last boss. Uh, there's no follow-up. This is not a fake out. It's not a first form. It's the final battle, a pile of pus. It doesn't even seem to be entirely sentient, let alone dangerous. It doesn't mean you don't still kill it, but yeah. A lot of people wonder what the hell the developers are trying to say with this damp squib of a final boss. Um, and I don't pretend that I know for sure, but it's my opinion that the whole idea is that all of the bad crap that follows the initial real problem can actually get worse and uphold all of the nonsense even as the thing that started all of it kind of decays into nothing. As I look around society now, I can't help but think that might be what they were trying to say. You fool. Don't you understand? No one wishes to go on. Thank you. 
At number three is Cruelty Squad. Most video games have their economies based around buying and selling items of fixed value. Cruelty Squad ties its economy to an entirely volatile stock market where the stock prices swing pretty wildly, as do the prices of organs and fish, other commodities, all swings back and forth in between missions. The stocks are also influenced by what happens on missions. Let's say you take on a mission to assassinate the CEO of a company that's on the market. Well, sell your investments before that mission because, ooh, you know what's going to happen. At least you better. I mean, if you don't, uh, spoiler alert, you lose your ass. Everything about Cruelty Squad is abrasive and uncomfortable, from the eye-searing color palette to the hideous environments, and frankly, look at this UI. What is this? Yeah, this all seems like it was made by a crazy man, and it probably was, but uh, the crazy man had a purpose. Almost everything about this game gleefully subverts the rules of game design and good taste. It's the economy, stupid. Was it Bill Clinton that said, I don't remember who said that. He called everybody who thought it wasn't the economy a moron, though. You know how upgrades work in any other game? You go to a store, everything's always the same price, you got a Skyrim-like barter system, you buy your equipment, your upgrades, you don't worry about fluctuations in price, and the vendors in Bethesda games don't have wildly different prices based on what you're getting or where you are. Uh, mostly just the same. It's not like that in Cruelty Squad. Instead of having everything have a price, like a set price, ah, this upgrade costs this amount, this weapon costs that amount. Everything in the game is tied to this volatile stock market that I mentioned. Seriously, everything will shift in price between missions. Sometimes your missions will affect stocks in ways that are not understandable. Like you get why the CEO thing clears out a company's stock price, right? You, uh, you understand that. Sometimes there's not really a great indicator like that. Uh, the intent is of course, a, a point to take down of late stage capitalism. Uh, one that is far less abstract than that blob boss at the end of Demon Souls. Uh, this one didn't take the kind of decoding that I think I gave you there in that last point, but uh, yeah. At number two is Pizza Tower, which is an anti-capitalist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. I haven't, I, I haven't thought about Pizza Tower enough to give you that kind of a thing. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, one thing I like about games is when they work. I, I don't want them just shutting down out of nowhere. When I play a game, I would rather it not crash. And I think that that's a rule most developers agree on. I say most because uh, there are a few fiery rebels out there who intentionally trigger crash days in the game. I know Undertale pulls a trick like that, but it's pretty near the end of the game and only under certain circumstances. Pizza Tower is kind of a uh, Sonic cross with Ren and Stimpy, and the main guy is kind of like an ugly Mario. Um, it's one of those, those rebels. If you sit on the title screen for about 40 seconds without doing anything, the main guy will jump at the screen, scream, and crash the game. It, it just turns off instantly. That's it. It's one of those tricks only possible in a PC game. If you tried to pull this sort of thing on a console, people would be freaking out. And that's probably why people don't intentionally crash games on purpose. It's probably why it's frowned upon. But there are some weird outliers and Pizza Tower is, I mean, this isn't the only way it's a weird outlier, but probably one of the more unique ways, actually. <laughs> And finally, at number one, uh, Frog Factions. There's Inscription, a game that has multiple layers, but at least the top layer actually looks like a real game. And then you've got Frog Factions, a game that looks like nothing. The name, the store page, everything about this one makes it look like a rudimentary math game for elementary school children. And, and even after playing it for a while, it takes some effort to find the deeper level. And that's the game. When you do finally break through, uh, the joke reveals itself. It's kind of an, a ridiculous experiment to make a game game that is as incoherent and ridiculous as possible. That's absurd enough, but the sequel is even more of a rule breaker. Instead of capitalizing on the previous game's success like you'd assume, they hit Frog Factions 2 inside of another game and didn't tell anybody what it was. Hundreds of shovelware garbage games get uploaded on Steam every week. 
Hell, sometimes that much can come out in a single day. Any other developer would love to have the name recognition of a game like Frog Factions, but they were deliberately avoiding that. It's, I mean, it is the internet, so people figured out that it was the sequel pretty quick. Uh, the game is called Glitterman Grove, a weird 2D management sim with fairies, but it takes even longer from there to get into the real game. Uh, these games just threw out the rulebook on how to market their games, and it somehow worked. I'll give you a quick bonus to uh, Desert Bus. Um, this game is, is intentionally aggravating as humanly possible. Created as part of the compilation Penn and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors, a game that never came out, Desert Bus was literally designed to be miserable. All you do, and I mean all you do, is drive a bus for eight hours between Tucson, Arizona and Las Vegas, Nevada in real time. Yes, real time. Further, the bus, it constantly lists to the right. If you go off the road, the engine stalls. You have to start the whole thing all over again. If you complete the journey, you get one point. That's it. You can't pause it. There's almost no scenery. There's no cars on the road. That's it. It's a game intentionally made to be as bad as possible, and it succeeds with flying colors. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications, and as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, like Falcon the Hero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.